The gospel reading is from Luke chapter 1, verses 28 to 36. In the, six, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him, to the, give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born with to be born will be holy. He will be called the he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Mary, did you want to pray for the preacher this morning? Thank you, Sharon. Let us pray. God, please favor Pastor Terry and give her healing emotionally and physically and spiritually and guide this church to be connected and to be nice to each other. And we all need each other so much. I've never heard Pastor Terry say a bad word about anybody. And I pray for her, and I pray for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. It was a good thing to have Miss Sarah up here as the liturgist. How old are you, dear? Fourteen. Fourteen. Stand up. I want you to stand up. It's our visual aid this morning. Fourteen, with her oxalotl t-shirt, or sweatshirt, and her unicorn hat. This is the age that Mary was when the angel came to her. This is the same age that Mary was when the angel came to you, about 14 years old. So thank you. You can sit down now. That's faith, isn't it? An angel comes to your home, and you don't know. I mean, angels did not have wings. Sorry to break everybody's hearts. So they did not have wings. Seraphim and cherubim had wings, but an angel looked like a person. Otherwise, we wouldn't read in Hebrews that we have entertained angels without knowing it. Right? Because if you had wings, they'd know you were an angel. But an angel comes to her and says, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. She has one question. How can this be? I've never seen a man. I've never been with a man. He says, With God, nothing is impossible. That's all she needs. What was the penalty for being an unwed mother in the first century in Palestine? Stoning to death. You shall drag her from her father's home to the gates of the city. There she shall be stoned unto death, for we must purge this evil from Israel. And yet she says, may it happen to me as you have said. I'm the Lord's servant. That's faith. That is expectant hope. That is trusting in God, which is what the root of hope is, isn't it? To trust in God's word and God's promises. So what are you expecting is going to happen in the world? How many think it's just going to go to hell in a handbasket? I said about that little plaque I had that had, you know, blessed are those who expect that they should never be disappointed. I also had someone gave me a bumper sticker that said, where, where are we going and why am I in this handbasket? Think about that one a moment. Where are we going and why am I in this handbasket? I neglected to put that on my car, but anyway, 
that's what people are expecting, that the world's just going to just continue to disintegrate until it blows up in its own mess. No, because Christ told us it's going to be a different world because he is coming to reclaim his people. He's coming to bring justice to the earth. And if we don't hope in that, then we're lost. We don't want to be lost, do we? We want to have the power of God. Because hope is about power, isn't it? Um, Tikva. And last week I was a little distracted up here because I ended up singing instead of the organ or the piano last week, which was strange. But um, I forgot the word yakal. I said there's a Hebrew word for hope and it's something. And I'll tell you next week, it's yakal. Yakal means to wait. Kava means to wait, but to wait expectantly something's going to change, and that becomes the root for tikva, which is to wait expectantly, which is also, ha-tikva is the Israeli national anthem. It's called the hope. Let me read the words to you. As long as the Jewish spirit is yearning deep in the heart, with eyes turned toward the east, looking toward Zion, then our hope, the 2,000-year-old hope, will not be lost, but to be a free people in our land, the land of Zion and Jerusalem. I did a study online with some rabbis who were looking at these passages talking about hope in the Hebrew context. They were saying that maybe they need to change the anthem because 20% of the um, people in living within Israel are not Jews. They want to be inclusive. These are rabbis speaking. Even though the world has become so anti-Semitic, it's crazy right now, the anti-Semitism that's going on. And it makes me think of the lady up here on the picture again, the hope. How many of you think it looks like hope? She's sitting on the world. Her feet are dirty from walking. She's tired. She's bent over. But she's listening to that one note that she can play on her lyre. Now, this is in the Tate Museum in Great Britain. I told you in my newsletter article that I found this painting when I was trying to go to sleep at night watching the British um, Antiques Road show sort of thing. This is the road trip, the celebrity road trip. I had no idea who these celebrities were, but they were, they went to the Tate Museum and they saw this painting, which was painted in 1886, the same year that the national anthem was written for Israel. Before there was an Israel, that was the anthem that was written, because Israel did not come into being until 1948. But there's been this long hope that they've held in their Messiah. We know him to be Jesus, but this hope, people said they should have called this one despair, but she is still playing and she's still listening to that faint, faint sound of hope in the world. We need to listen for it, whether it's faint or not. Now, Stephen Charleston. Anyone heard of Stephen Charleston? If you look at my Facebook page, you've seen some quotes from him. He is a Native American elder. He's a Choctaw nation um, representative, but he is also an Episcopal bishop. They don't seem to go hand in hand very well, do they? He wrote several books, and this one's called The Ladder of Hope, Ladder to the Light, an Indigenous Elders' Meditations on Hope and Courage. And I'd, I'd advise you to get this and read it because it's got such great, powerful writings about what hope does in the world. And Stephen Charleston talks about the Trail of Tears that his ancestors walked. Mine did too. My mother's family is descended from Cherokee people. I didn't know that until I was probably in the third or fourth grade. I was so excited to find that out. My father's parents said to me, this is one of the, the roots of my work against racism in the world. When my father's father found out that I was going to go to school and tell the teacher that we were descended from Cherokee people, he said, don't tell anybody that. That's terrible because they're dirty people. They're worse than being a colored person. My grandfather said that to me. Now, granted, he was born in 1892, and he had a different outlook on the world than most people do today. But I thought, what's wrong with being a colored person, much less being a Native American person? But I went to school, and I told my teacher very proudly, because I went to school with Holly Hopkins, whose parents and grandparents and great-great-great-grandparents had come on the Mayflower to the U.S. And she said, my family came on the Mayflower. And she said, that's so wonderful, that's so wonderful, that's so wonderful. I stood up, being the smart aleck that I was, even at eight years old, and said, when Holly's parents came, or her ancestors came on the Mayflower, mine were here to greet them. And my teacher said, that does not matter. We're talking about where did your family come from from Europe. It's how we treat other people, isn't it? But Stephen 
Charleston writes from the perspective of someone whose family traveled the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma. That's what he writes. Here's a holy question of faith. We are, strong as, we are as strong as what we hope. People without hope, even if they possess all the wealth in the world, are weak and easily swayed. On the other hand, a small band of human beings can shift the tides of history if they have sufficient hope in what they see as the future. This may happen all at once or it may happen over generations. Hope may be dormant beneath the weight of oppression. It may be small and precious, handed down through word of mouth, told in stories, preserved in ceremonies, may go underground, a hidden light to keep the vision alive. So it was with my people for generations. When our languages, our way of worship, and our culture were forbidden, we handed hope down in whispers and signs and songs, secret dances under the moon until the day liberation would come. The vision of our future would never be forbidden. We have got to claim hope in Christ as Christ's people because we are as strong as what we hope. And if we hope for a world that is different than the one we live in, we will see that happen. And maybe our song is as quiet as hers, but we've got to start singing it. Stephen Christian um, Charleston goes on to write, Hope is a decision. By making it, we choose light over darkness. We claim the power of blessing the Spirit has entrusted us. Understand that love was not meant for only us, but for all those who, like us, have known the fear of being lost or alone. Hope is creation in action. The word kava means hope with expectancy. The word kiva is a Native American word, spelled a little differently, K-I-V-A, as opposed to Q-A-V-A-H. But kiva is talking about the Native American practice of going underground. You know, they dig holes, they call them sweat lodges, things like that, depending on the tradition. But the word kiva really means womb. He says, you go into the dark to be born into the light. One of the rungs of going to the light is hope for him. But if we're looking at being in a womb, it's like Mary and Joseph and Jesus, isn't it? Jesus was born of a human mother to show us what God is able to do because with God, nothing is impossible. If, if we believe that, then we've got hope. If we've got hope, we can change the world to what it should be. In the name of Jesus Christ, turn it right side up. It's been a hard week. I told you, it's been a very hard week for me. My best friend from seminary died. Y'all, some of you met her, actually. She and her husband worshipped here with us when I first came to Epworth. She was a superintendent in the, what used to be the West Michigan Conference, which is now the Michigan Conference of the United Methodist Church. We met when we were being arrested. We met in a paddy wagon. How's that for a strange meeting? When we were protesting apartheid at the South African Embassy, we sat next to each other in the paddy wagon. We were thrown in there together. And she says, hi, I'm Tammy. I said, I'm Terry. And she said, I know. She said, I'm pregnant. And I said, wow, really? She had found out the day before she was expecting her son, Caleb. And he grew up, and he's a pastor. Her husband became a pastor. So three pastors in one family. And she's an amazing person. She still is. I know she still is because she's with Christ now, fully restored. But she died of what killed my husband and Pushpa's husband. The week my husband died, Tammy sent me flowers. She said, I can't come because I got charged conferences unless you really need me. And I said, I'll need you later. My friend who was a bishop said the same thing. But Tammy texted me every morning, but as soon as she texted me, I'd call her, and she didn't answer the phone. And I just kept trying to get her, and I couldn't get her. I wanted to hear her voice. And then she called me the next week. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm driving. And she said, pull over and call me back. I thought, that's very strange. And I called her back, and she said, I have MSA. She said, Tommy was harder than telling her mother, because I knew it was coming for her, because it had taken my husband, and it took Pushpa's husband, and now it's taken my best friend terrible illness. But one thing she didn't do, she never lost hope. Her husband said that she never, when someone said, why could this, how could this happen to you? You're the best person I know. You're so strong. You're so faithful. And she said, it's not like that. She said, don't ever say that to me. Why not me? Better me than someone else. I don't want to say anybody else suffer like this. She died proclaiming her savior. That is hope. That is what Mary was saying when she said, with God, all things are possible. When the angel said that to her, that's what he meant. 
All things are possible. Say that with me. With God, nothing is impossible. Say it like you mean it. With God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? And you have to start expecting good things and hoping for the world to change. Because hope is action. Hope is power and strength. Maybe you're feeling like the lady sitting on the planet, because that's what I feel like today, honestly. But I'm still plucking my string. I'm still listening for the music of God, and I hear it in your lives, in your testimony, in your witness. What a lovely day to have Sylvia over at the organ again, playing with us. And although, Femi, we're glad you're here too, because it's a beautiful, beautiful combination we have today. But you gotta hope, folks. If you lose hope, we are going to be lost, and we cannot be lost because Christ is in our midst. Emmanuel means God is with us. It doesn't mean God was with us. It means God is with us because Christ lives in us and through us. Amen? Amen.